Welcome, Dr. Franz Deval. Uh, you're a professor of psychology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and you have done a lot of research into um, emotions in animals. You've mm -hmm. done a lot of primate research. Can you tell me about the day that you got the idea, I want to look into empathy in monkeys? Uh, I, I was initially interested in reconciliation in, in chimpanzees. and. For example, after a fight, they come together and they kiss and embrace, and then they groom. And uh, this is like 25 years ago. I got interested in that. But in that same, in those same studies, I noticed that after a fight, there are also other individuals, outsiders, who come to the victim of the fight, the one who got beaten up or whatever, uh, and they put an arm around them and they try to calm them down. We, I call that consolation. And initially, we didn't pay much attention to that. I, I thought it was sort of interesting, but I was more interested in the reconciliation part, which relates to the relationship between individuals and how they need to repair the relationship after a fight and things like that. So for, I think, 15 years or so, I ignored the consolation part. And empathy has become a very important topic in the last 15 years or so in the human literature and, and in the neurosciences. And um, that's where it occurred to me that consolation obviously has probably something to do with empathy was because they're reacting to the distress of somebody and they're providing reassurance to that individual. And so it's much later than that I picked that up. So that's more recent, actually, that I did that. As you asked, thinking of um, <clears throat> if you could tell that story you told the other day with you, you saw the two chimpanzees, you know, hugging, probably reconciliation, mm -hmm. the first time you actually got the idea that you should look into um, yeah, reconciliation and, and uh, emotions. In, in, um... Well, reconciliation was, at the time that I started my studies, was not a topic. No one talked about that ever. Uh, anyone who talked about aggression talked only about A is aggressive to B or A wins and B loses. And um, what I noticed one day at the, at the Arnhem Zoo where I worked with chimpanzees is that after a fight, a major fight, uh, maybe 15 minutes later, I saw two chimpanzees embrace and kiss. Very intense, and the whole group actually was responding to it. Everyone else was responding to it and hooting and, and looking at it. And uh, I thought it was a very special moment, but uh, it's only a couple of hours later that I thought, well, those were the to same two chimps who had the fight. And so that's where it occurred to me that this was probably a reconciliation. And, and from that day on, I've seen many tons of it. So, so actually, you need to label something and recognize it. And once you recognize it, you, you can see it many times. But before that time, and, and when I reported that for the first time, I was a student at the time, uh, I reported it at meetings, people would sort of laugh like, how's that possible? Reconciliation in animals. Everyone knows that they only fight. That's all they do. And um, so I had to come with data. I had to produce actual data showing that they're doing this and that it's not it's not an accident that this happens, but that this happens regularly, and that, that they have more contacts after fights than without fights, and that the contacts look different, and so on. And so um, out of that grew st the study of reconciliation, which then was taken to all sorts of other animals. And, and now we have data on lots of different primate species, and actually of some non-primates, such as goats, and hyenas, and dolphins, and so on. I was thinking of, of that, that moment when, when you realized that reconciliation was going on, something mm -hmm. that nobody else had thought about. Did that open a door in your own thinking of animals as such? Well, it made, for me, it made the study of aggression much more interesting because I had been instructed as a student to study aggressive behavior as everyone was doing that at the time. And um, aggression per se is not particularly interesting. So I feel because what you have is A attacks B and, and A wins or A loses. That's basically all there is to it. And so you can measure the intensity of the aggression and the causes. But I, I didn't find that particularly interesting. When you look at reconciliation, it becomes far more interesting because then it becomes an issue of how do you resolve issues within your relationship? Do you do it aggressively or non-aggressively? And if aggression occurs, who reconciles with whom and how often? And it becomes a much more interesting issue when you put it in the relationship network, uh, as we did. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, doing research on conflict resolution, uh, you came from Holland working with chimpanzees, you went to the US, and you started working on bonobos as well. What did you discover about them and their conflict resolution? 
Well, the bonobos I studied initially, my only um, goal was to compare bonobos with chimpanzees and to see if they were uh, similar. Or, at the time, everyone assumed they were very similar because they were called pygmy chimpanzees and everyone thought they were basically the same as chimpanzees, just a smaller size. And then when I studied the bonobos, I discovered that everything that chimpanzees do with kissing and embracing and grooming, they do with sex which made them extremely popular in certain circles uh, <laughs> because they have sex in all combinations of individuals and so on. Um, uh, I, looked, I looked at it at the time mostly as they have a different way of reconciling their fights and it's sexy. Uh, but very soon I discovered that um, there, were, there were quite a few people who worked on bonobos at the time, both in the field and in captivity, that no one was talking about the sex, which which I found so strange. So, so everyone knew about it. If you, if you mentioned it to them, yes, yeah, I know that they do that, but they do, would not talk about it. So people were extremely shy about it. And it's maybe because of my Dutch background in the American culture be, uh, being quite different from the American culture that I, I decided this needs to be communicated. And so at some point I ran into another Franz, uh, also from Holland, Franz Lanting, who is a very famous nature photographer. And he said, I have, gone to the Congo and I've taken all these pictures for National Geographic and no one wants to publish them um, because again these are bonobos and they, they're having sex. And so we decided that we were going to bring that to the public and, and that's how we published the book with um, bonobos and, and that's how the bonobo became a very popular hippie type primate. Right. Can that kind of conflict resolution have any implication in human society? I think humans use sex for the same purposes. They don't do it, bonobos do it all over the place with everybody. So that's a bit different, I hope, with most human societies. But humans certainly use sex for social purposes, yes. That there's actually some expressions. The French have an expression, uh, la réconciliation sur l'oreiller, uh, which is the a reconciliation on the pillow. So they have actually an expression for it, as you would expect from the French. Yeah, exactly. But would you characterize humans as sort of having strategies from both chimpanzees and bonobos? Yeah, I think, I think humans have, for example, the male bonding, which is very prominent in chimpanzees and is basically absent in bonobos. There's very little of that. So the, the chimpanzee males are very cooperative. They're sometimes aggressively cooperative. They hunt together, they, they invade territories together, but they also have a whole coalition system of politics. Like the alpha male is never alpha male by himself. He's alpha male with the support of some other males. So they have all these cooperations going on between males, which is very much a human pattern also. Yeah. And you've actually seen, I think, um, a very disturbing scene with chimpanzees hunting each other, actually two chimpanzees killing another male. Yeah, this happened at the Arnhem Zoo right before I left the Netherlands. There was a big fight between three males where two males together killed another male. And uh, at that time, uh, this was in, the, in 1980, we knew of a few cases of killings of chimpanzees in the field, but that was between groups, between different groups. And in this case, it was within my own group. They, these, these chimps knew each other very well. They had lived together all the time. And so at the time, there was some speculation that maybe this was not normal, that this happened. But now we know from cases in the field, we know that sometimes, it's not common, but sometimes chimpanzee males kill also within their own group. And so that, that's what I basically observed at the Arnhem Zoo. Do you think that could be called evil? Is that the chimpanzee version of evil? Evil is a moral judgment. Huh? So, so usually we stay away from that as animal observers. We're not gonna say this is good and this is evil. Um, evil in the sense of that they themselves disapprove of it. Yes, because um, when this happened, this, ha this fight happened at night and uh, the females could see the cage of the males in which it happened, in the, ni the night cage. And uh, the females who saw the fight happening, and we know that because we know where they were sitting in the, in the night quarters, they, they were very upset by the whole thing. And the next day when we released the entire co colony outside, they live on a big island, when we released all of them, uh, several females, and these were the females who had seen the fight, they went after the aggressors and they chased them up into a tree and they kept them there for a very long time. So they were very mad at what had happened. And, and if this had happened in the group, the females would have interfered, I know that, because they often did that. They, the, the females in that particular colony, they were very powerful. Uh, there were about 10 or 12 of them. 
and they were very solidary with each other because there was a top female who organized everything among them and she would have definitely stopped it. Uh, she often stopped male fights and, and a, a serious fight like this, she would have stopped it. Do you ever see punishment of perpetrators among primates? Yes, uh, so in this case th there was some of that and, and a, a typical example a funny example actually, is we had a rule at the Arnhem colony that um, all the chimpanzees needed to be inside in the evening before they would get their meal. And so we would not feed them unless everyone had come into the building. Now one very nice warm night, there were two adolescent females, let's say two teenager type females who had stayed outside and didn't want to come in. And uh, so the, the whole colony was waiting for three hours for their meal. So you can imagine they were not in a good mood. And they, these two females finally came in and we kept them separate and then we fed the whole colony. The next morning we released the colony and uh, the first thing that the whole colony did was chase those two young females and beat them up. And they were that evening, they were the first one to come back in. And, and so they were, we had imposed the rule of the, of, the, of the dinner time and they were enforcing our rule basically. Mm -hmm. So this is actually premeditated punishment. Well, I don't know how premeditated, they, they must have been the whole night, they must have been grumpy about this whole thing and, uh, and taking it out on those two. Yeah, they have a good memory, so it's not so difficult for a chimp. Yeah. So this is, is perhaps the root of human warfare as well? Well, this is closer to human uh, law enforcement, you know, <laughs> this is closer to uh, uh, prescriptive rules, basically. And we do that all the time. We have rules for things. And if you don't follow the rules, you, you get punished. Let's talk about um, emotions. I mean, we humans are wonderful creatures and we pride ourselves on our emotions that, you know, make us different from all other creatures in the world. So animals don't have emotions. Isn't that so? I'm not sure because, you know, the, the, there was a time where they would say animals cannot think and emotions was fine. And, and now we live in a time where people say, oh, animals do some thinking, but they have no emotions. So, so they do need to have, have information processing capacities and they do need to have emotions. So if your dog barks at the door at a stranger, obviously the, the dog is emotionally reacting to something. So, so and, and, and dogs and cats, they give affection and they receive affection and they need affection. So it's very obvious that animals have emotions like aggression, fear, affection, uh, sexual emotions, all, all of that is present. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, so for example, jealousy is a, more a bit more complex emotion than, than those. Uh, but everyone knows who has a pet that pets can get jealous. And so I think all of that is present. Maybe the more complex emotions are not present. So for example, guilt and shame, they are very complex emotions which require a high level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And they may not be present, but I think the basic emotions are all there. But we, we used to say that um, animals say, um, a monkey for example, an ape, would not be able to feel sympathy with another ape. Um, they might look as, as if they, they sit down in company with each other and it, it all looks fine, but, but they don't feel sympathy for each other like we do. Is, is that true? That's certainly not the case, I think. So, so we have done a lot of study of what we call consolation, where, uh, for example, uh, there's a fight and someone loses a fight and other chimps will go to that individual and put an arm around it or groom him. Or a, a young chimpanzee falls out of a tree and, and screams and others will rush over and try to calm it down. That kind of behavior is also known of, of dolphins and elephants. And so um, these basic expressions of sympathy are present in animals. There's even a recently a study that came out on mice where people had done experiments on how mice perceive, perceive the pain of other mice. And so, so all of these things are present, I think, in other mammals at least, maybe not in fish, but certainly in mammals. But how can you see that a mouse feels another mouse's pain? Oh, you cannot ask them. That, that's the big difference with humans. But, but you can see if they respond to it and how they respond to it. And so, for example, in the mouse study, they've, they showed that the, the mice have an intensified pain response themselves if they are present with somebody else who is in pain. And so there's pain contagion, so to speak, they call it, uh, between the mice. But that's almost what we humans call empathy. If I see somebody falling on the street, I, I get this reaction that I can almost feel this person's, you know, yeah. falling. 
So that actually happens? That's a very automatic reaction and, and have been shown in people now. And they do that in PET scanners. So you do neural imaging. Uh, so, for example, you present a person who is in a PET scanner with a situation of somebody else being in pain. And if you see somebody else in pain, it activates the same centers in your brain that would be activated if yourself are in pain. So, so you basically mirror the situation of somebody else. And the mirror neurons which are involved in this have been demonstrated now in monkeys. They, they were discovered in monkeys. And so they're probably very general in the mammals. Do you remember when you started to think about doing research with, with with animals, uh, feelings, animals, emotions. When did you say to yourself, there must be some kind of, of, there must be the same feelings in animals than in humans. I want to study this. Well, well, my assumption has always been that since we are primates, our basic psychology is a primate psychology. And so uh, if, if you react in a particular way and a chimpanzee react in the same way to the same situation, I assume that the psychology behind it is similar too. That's not the assumption many psychologists make because most psychologists have been trained in the Western tradition that an animal and a human are different things and, and that you cannot really compare them. But I've always assumed that, that there's similarity. My own interest in these processes of emotion started when I started doing studies on reconciliation. So for example, if two chimpanzees have a fight, after the fight they come together and they kiss and embrace each other and then they sit down and they groom each other. Or if two bonobos have a fight, they usually have sex after the fight and they come together that way. That's but almost like humans, actually. Humans do that too. <laughs> humans don't do that in the public spheres as much as, as bonobos do, but humans do use sex for social purposes, obviously. And so I got interested in these processes of reconciliation and in that context I saw that very often they also try to calm somebody down who is distressed. And so that's how I got interested in the expressions of empathy. Mm -hmm. um, but how much alike are humans and, and say chimpanzees, for example? Are our emotions, the, the way we feel our emotions, would you say that that's probably the same for a chimpanzee? To be sad is the same for a chimpanzee as for us? the way it feels. I think so. For example, chimpanzees can be very attached to each other. So if one of them dies, they can be very strongly affected by that. So if, for example, if a female loses her offspring, she's very much affected by that. And for days she may not eat, sometimes for weeks she may not eat. Uh, and that's known actually for many animals who are pair bonded, for many birds. Uh, for example, if you have two birds who are pair bonded and one of them dies, the other one may a couple of weeks later die also because they're so attached to each other. So, so in that sense, all these Emotional processes, I think, are very similar. The only, only way that we differ is that we can try to formulate them and that we try to express in words sometimes how we feel. So, so the animals don't have that problem. They don't, need to, <laughs> they don't need to think about what they're feeling. They just feel it. Yeah, they don't need to go to the psychologist, yeah, basically. Yeah. They, just, yeah, they just feel. Um, but so do you think that the, it's true it's, that you can say that we actually have the same emotions. Emotions are brain impulses, brain activity, and that is pretty much the same. But then on top of our emotions, we humans have thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, we have big brains with a lot of thoughts that other animals lack. And that would be perhaps the big difference. Yeah, but I don't, so, don't know if the thoughts are separate from the emotions. That's what people always think, that you have the, the ratio and the emotions and they're separate things. But basically, you, you cannot think without emotions. So if, if, because the emotions make you attach value to certain outcomes. Uh, and it is well known that people who are low on, uh, let's say, emotional activity, they have trouble concentrating and thinking because they don't have that kind of value attachment going on. So, so the two are not really separate. And very often, we use our thinking to justify where we got emotionally. So emotionally, we decide we want to do this or we want to do that. And then uh, in words, we justify how we got to that decision. So basically, emotions are automatic decision processing devices, almost. Yeah, emotion, most emotions, I'm not sure that it's true for all, but most emotions are adapted to produce an outcome that is good for you as an individual. And so uh, if you see a snake, you have fear, and that's an adaptive outcome. You, you move away from the snake, so snake fear is an adaptive process. And so a lot of these emotions, they, uh, they are pre-programmed, so to speak, to make quick decisions about things. And, and, and we still rely very much on our emotions, in, in also in what we call rational decision-making.
So this thing that we say that, that human beings are very rational. If we were only rational, if we didn't have our emotions telling us what to think, we actually couldn't act in the world. Yeah, to say that humans are very rational, if you see what humans do, uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they can be rational, let's yeah. say. They can be, under certain circumstances. But are we still very much monkey-like, actually? I think the basic human psychology is, is primate-like. So, mm -hmm. so the basic human psychology is, is like that of a primate. There's a few additions to it, like uh, more complex uh, self-oriented processes, like shame and guilt, maybe. Uh, our moral emotions, uh, everything related to language is of course very complex and is typically human, but other than that our basic psychology is, is primate-like. Mm -hmm. But feelings like, say, um, love for example, what is that for? Is that a, a, a human feeling or...? Love, if you mean romantic love between man and woman, is among the primates very typically human. Mm -hmm. not, not if you look beyond the primates. If you look at birds, they have lifelong bonds between male and female, and there must be some love between them, I would assume. Mm -hmm. But in the primates, we are the only primate uh, in, in our close family here who has uh, family relationships, and so, so who has a male-female children type of uh, family structure. And so the pair bonding that we have as a human species is very typical of us. Mm -hmm. But wh where did that come from? Why are we so different in that way? I think we evolved to have a paternal care. And uh, because we, we, we entered an environment which was much more hostile than the forest, we entered a very difficult environment, and it became adaptive, in our case, to have males involved in care for the offspring. And so that's where you get the pair bonding, and, and that's where you get males protecting their investment by making sure that females don't have relationships with somebody else. Uh, so all of that is connected to each other. Um, and in that sense, we differ quite a bit from chimpanzees and bonobos, because in, in chimpanzees and bonobos, the males uh, have no responsibility whatsoever for offspring. That's all female work. And, and, and they have interbirth intervals of six years. Whereas we, with, with the males involved in family care, we can have intervals of two years. And, and I think that's why we populated the world and not the chimpanzee, yeah. because we could produce many more offspring than they could. Mm -hmm. So actually, love between men and women helped populate the world in more than one sense. Yeah, because love between men and women, uh, you, can, you can look at it as love from the romantic and philosophical perspective, but actually the biologist looks, looks at it from a much more utilitarian perspective. We look at it, how, how does it help the reproduction of these individuals? Mm -hmm. Hmm. So today you would say it, it is actually very human, very normal that, that human males should take care of their children, for example. You say it's almost an evolutionary... Uh, they, they should protect their family and uh, take care of their family. Whether they need to be strolling down with kids in their arms in the street, uh, that's something else. But, but I think males did evolve in our species to take care of their family. Mm -hmm. Man has been called many things, the tool maker. Um, it's, we've also been called the moral animal. Uh, and we've always said that morality is something very evolved, it's something that only uh, comes out in, in human beings. But that doesn't seem to be true either. No, th there, was, there was the idea that morality is actually an invention of the human species, a cultural, religious invention. And that naturally we would never be moral because naturally we are nasty and bad. Uh, I, I call that veneer theory. It's like uh, we are naturally selfish monsters, but we have a little veneer of morality over it. And I don't believe that at all. I believe that a lot of the moral emotions are very old and older than our species, in fact. I'm not saying that chimpanzees are moral beings necessarily, but they have empathy and sympathy and they have reciprocity, which are the two main elements of human. For example, the, the golden rule that we have is basically a rule of reciprocity and empathy. So, so we do... Explain that a little more, the golden rule. Don't do... What, what is it again? What is the golden rule? Uh, don't do on, onto others what you don't want them to do, do yeah. to you. So, so it's a rule of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. it, we, we need to treat each other as equals, and it's a rule of empathy. You need to understand what, what is good for the others, also good for you, and the other way around. 
So, so I think empathy and reciprocity are at the core of human morality, and for both we can find parallels. And we do a lot of experiments on reciprocity in, in the primates. So for example, we give them food and they can share the food, and then we see who shares with whom, and is that dependent on who has groomed whom in the past or not. And, and so we, we can do actual experiments. On monkeys we've done experiments where we put them in a test chamber where there's mesh between them and they can share food through the mesh. And so we give one monkey food for one period of time and then it shares with the other. And then we give the other food and see if the sharing depends on how much it got from the other. And so we, we study reciprocity that way. But there's another experiment that, that's really interesting with capuchin monkeys where you've seen um, a capuchin monkey actually show some kind of, um, what would you call it? Um, well, we, we call it that they object to an inequality. So it is, it's yes. called inequity aversion. So what we do with the capuchin monkeys, we put them side by side, and these are monkeys that know each other. So, so we have two monkeys who perform the same task uh, 25 times in a row for the same reward. And both, both of them get a small piece of cucumber. And then they do it 25 times and they're perfectly happy. We alternate between the two. Then at some point, one of them we give grapes. Now, grapes are much better than pieces of cucumber. So it's, it's almost as if you give them a race, so to speak. You give them more money for the same task. Uh, at that point, the one who is working for cucumber uh, loses interest in the task and throws out the cucumber and gets angry and, and at some point just doesn't want to do the task anymore. He thinks, he thinks actually, the, the monkey feels that, that he's being treated immorally? Well, I'm not sure that it's um, it's it's um, that that he's reasoning morally, but right. but but I do think he is responding to getting less than somebody else. So even though the food by itself is perfectly fine, so if you give a monkey a piece of cucumber, it will always eat it right away. So the food is perfectly fine, but not if somebody else is getting better food. And then, then you're not. And so it's called inequity aversion, which is a very big part of human justice. Basically, mm -hmm. we're very sensitive to that. And uh, we've done now experiments with chimpanzees. We've, we've even done one additional experiment because in this study, you could argue maybe they're not reacting to the other one getting grapes, but they're reacting to the presence of grapes. Just the fact that these things are there makes them look at the grapes and ignore the cucumber. So we did recently a variation on this test. We would give both of them cucumber, but before we gave it, we would wave a grape in front of them and then put the grape away. It's actually a very mean experiment. Um, but they, they did not react to that. So it's not the fact that the grape is there. That, that doesn't bother them. What bothers them is that the other one is getting the grape. Yeah. But morality, when we talk about moral sense for human beings, we have this um, feeling that it, it's, it's something that we, we're taught when we're children. Uh, it was always said that morality is something you have to teach children, and it's, it's a cultural thing. We just define in each culture what is morally uh, good, what is morally bad here. Uh, but that turns out not to be true. We come with, with some kind of moral programming almost. Well, I do think you need to teach I do think you need to teach children some morality, though. It's a very good thing to do. For example, uh, sharing of toys and food uh, doesn't come naturally to kids. You need to inculcate that. So, so the teaching part I'm not against, but when we teach morality, we're using basic human psychology, and the basic human psychology is primate psychology. And so we can emphasize empathy and, and tell our children, you need to look out for your friend because he's hurt or whatever. So we can teach them empathy, but still we're, we're using a capacity that, that's already there. And that's true for all human teaching. We're not teaching brand new things to children. We're not teaching things that would never occur to them. All we're doing is emphasizing natural tendencies or de-emphasizing sometimes if we tell them not to fight, for example, we're de-emphasizing a natural tendency. But again, morality is, uh, it has a strong emotional component is what uh, people are finding out nowadays. It's not just rationality. Oh, for sure. The, the, the Kantian view, of course, which has been popular for long, Immanuel Kant, is a very rationalistic view of morality. But uh, I think it's total nonsense. I think morality is basically an emotional process, and the rationalizations come on top of that. And are sort of interesting, but they, they are not fundamental to it. And so, for example, if you put people in a brain scanner and you look at their brain during moral decision-making, moral decision-making evol involves a lot of old mammalian emotional parts of the brain. 
And so it's not a purely rational process. The emotions are very important in it. And there are actually, um, I think, experiments that show that a lot of the time there is both there is rational thought going on and there is emotional response. And the emotional response wins the battle. Much of the time, yeah, much of, much of the time, that's true. And, and that's why I, I'm much more a believer of, in David Hume, who is a philosopher before Kant, who said that the moral sentiments are basic. Uh, and actually, in Scandinavia, you had uh, Edward Westermark, who is a Swedish, um, Swedish Finnish. Uh, anthropologist who had the same sort of ideas. He had a sort of Darwinian view of morality, which was very strongly based in moral sentiment theory. I guess then what you're saying is that we have sort of very basic um, moral rules almost that come from our private, uh, primate lineage, uh, very basic um, moral decisions mm -hmm. that we just make sort of automatically. But then on top of that, we, we can reason. So we can have different moral systems in different cultures. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, the, our morality makes use of very basic emotions in the sense that uh, we are worried about a friend because the friend is sick, which is a basic, a basic empathy reaction. And from that com comes moral decision making. So moral decision making in involves that kind of emotions. That doesn't mean that the rational process is, is irrelevant because we still need to take decisions. Do we care for this one or for that one? Because we cannot care for everybody in the world. And so we do need to make uh, very complex decisions uh, very often. And we cannot go purely by emotions. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would not uh, get you a moral system. So it's, it's a very complex question, but all I'm claiming is that uh, those basic processes that are involved are not inventions of the human. They are, they are basically inventions of modern nature. But, but the way that, that um, moral reasoning works today, I suppose, is also very much... Um, it says something about evolution, because we, have, we feel this uh, moral impetus to uh, help somebody who's right next to us, who falls down or who lacks money, he begs in the street or something. But it's, it, it takes more reasoning, more rationality to help somebody who's you know, a victim of something on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I suppose, could be because we evolved in tight groups. Yeah, yeah that kind of moral decision making, for, for example, it was very interesting that when the tsunami hit uh, Indonesia, I think there were many Swedes and Norwegians uh, involved in that as tourists. And as a result, Sweden and, and Norway, they gave more money to the tsunami victims in Indonesia than most other countries. And, and so as soon as you have a link, a sort of in-group link with uh, even a distant place like Indonesia, uh, that, uh, that, of course, uh, stimulates giving and stimulates altruistic behavior. This is very well known in the primates. In the primates, of course, altruistic behavior is much more developed between individuals who know each other than individuals who don't know each other. So, for example, we are doing experiments on food sharing and altruism in primates, and if you do that with primates who don't know each other, you don't get anything. They, they don't care about strangers, just like humans often do. But so is, is, is this a very essential uh, human trait uh, that, that we actually we can help people that we have never seen before, people we don't know. Um. I, I think yeah, I think humans are capable of stretching these things much further. So so the the the, the basic process of sharing with in group is is very similar to what we see in the primates, but we're able to stretch that to to out groups. And and actually, the human human morality is at the moment in a phase in a very complex phase where it is uh, expanding and where we believe, for example, in universal human rights. Now, I'm sure long ago no one believed in that kind of thing. You, your neighbors, you could kill them at, at will and no one cared about it. And so we're now living in a system where we sit in a, in a globalization, basically, of morality, where we, where we believe that every human life counts. And, and it, I think it's very different from the old days where I don't think the lives of other people counted. So basically what we're seeing now is we're not evolving biologically very fast, but our morality, our mentalities, our thinking, that's all evolving very fast. Yeah, but it is, it is a stretch. I think it's fragile. So, so as soon as, for example, let's say Europe uh, has a massive hunger, there's no food, uh, maybe not, no water around, it, it's all getting very miserable. I'm, I'm sure that as soon as that happens, people are going to only care about themselves.
So it is, it is dependent on the affordability of this kind of morality. If we can afford it, yes, we will do it. But if we can't, we won't. So then we're back to us being actually a chimpanzee with a nice veneer and, and some you know, potentials we can do. We have potentials we, and we, we have a lot of good potentials <laughs> and we can use those. Yeah. It's not true that uh, primates will never care about anybody else than their in-group. So, so for example, there are stories of them caring even for other species. Uh, there's certainly stories of them caring for... Uh, so, for example, there's the famous story of Binti Jua, which was a, uh, a gorilla at the Brookfield Zoo who cared for a boy who had fallen into her enclosure. The boy was unconscious, and she took the boy to a place where humans could take care of it, and she calmed the boy down and everything. So she took care of another species. Uh, there's also the story of a bonobo female who, who had a bird... Uh, enter into her enclosure at the zoo and the bird was uh, stunned because it flew against the glass and she picked up the bird and she brought it to the highest point of her enclosure and she unfolded the wings and she sent it out and, and uh, so she was doing actually what is good for a bird it's not good for a bonobo but it's good for a bird so she was adapting her her helping response to what the bird needed so, so I think there's many of that kind of examples. They, they are mostly anecdotal because in nature this sort of thing doesn't happen very often that you encounter an other species in need. And in addition, in nature, uh, I think the problem there is that, that bonobos or chimpanzees, they are so driven by their need to find food that they don't have time for other creatures. So they, they would certainly not spend time on that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then if, if you take um, bonobos and put them in, say, a zoo or somewhere where they're, they're fed every day and they have a lot more surplus and, and they're taken care of, do they change their uh, behavior in general very much? Well, the, this kind of behavior they change. They have more time and so they, they do these kind of things. The, their uh, general psychology doesn't really change. So, for example, in captivity, chimpanzees are more aggressive and more uh, volatile in their emotions, and bonobos are more sexy and more peaceful than the chimpanzees are. So, and that's true also in nature. If you go look at chimpanzees in nature, the chimpanzees are more aggressive and the bonobos are more peaceful. Who would you say that human beings are more like the chimpanzees or the bonobos? I think we have a little bit of both. I call us bipolar apes for that reason, is that we have a little bit, we have the, certainly the aggressive side very clearly of the chimpanzee, and we also have the sexy side and, and the more empathic side of the bonobo. And, and so when humans are bad, they are worse than any animal that I know, and when human are, humans are good, they're actually better than any animal that I know. So, so we have an enormous scala of, of possibilities and uh, that makes us a very complex species because we need to decide between all these different possibilities that we have in our behavior. But where did, where did this whole um, huge scale scope of possibilities come from? Uh, do we know anything about where in, in the brain that is located? What, what I'm not sure that that's located, located in one place and, and, and of course it's too actually for every animal. Every animal has the possibility of being extremely aggressive and extremely uh, nice. Uh, certainly animals with parental care. Well, well there are animals of course who don't have parental care so they have no need to develop the let's say the affectionate possibilities that you need to raise offspring but the birds and the mammals they all raise offspring and so they have these very positive tendencies also. We talked about um, love before. Romantic love is, is a very human thing. Um, how about evil? Is that also a, a sort of distinctly human...? Depends on what you mean by evil. If, if you mean by evil killing somebody else, then of course many animals do that and can do that. But do they do it for no reason? If, if they don't want to eat the other animal or...? Yeah, killing animals for food, so what predators do, is not usually what we call violent behavior, even though it is obviously violent, but we, we put that in a different category than aggressive behavior. Aggressive behavior is, is, is within the own species, and uh, chimpanzees, for example, the males may on occasion kill other males. Um, and so uh, all of that is possible. If you mean torturing or killing for no reason at all, just for the fun of it, I think that's a possibility, certainly, in the chimpanzee. For example, chimpanzees, it's known, um, to give two examples. One example comes from, from Köhler, who had chimpanzees in captivity, and they had chickens walking around outside of the fence, and they would 
throw breadcrumbs to get the chickens to come close. The chimps would do that. Throw the breadcrumbs and get them close, and as soon as they came close, they would poke them with sharp sticks. Not necessarily to eat them, but just for the fun of it. This, this was a game that they played with the chickens, and the chickens were stupid enough to play along with the game. Of course, the chickens didn't look at it as a game. Uh, the other situation that I've seen is we did experiments one time with chimpanzees who, where one chimpanzee would discover a lot of interesting food inside a building and would be eating all these apples while the other chimpanzees were looking all through a small window and could see them eat the good food. And the window was open, um, but they couldn't get through it. And we've seen chimps, it was very funny, we would, we've seen chimps uh, take an apple and hold it out uh, in front of the window, uh, out of reach of the chimps who would stick their arms through the window to get at it, and they would just hold it back, and, the, and they would sit there holding the apple while the others couldn't get it. And so they were really teasing the other ones uh, with the good food that they had. Yeah. So basically, it seems to me that there is no human emotion that is ex exclusively human. Mm -hmm. It's it's all there in in different apes and monkeys, in some proto form at least. Yeah, yeah, it's basically all there. Yeah. So what what is special about us? Do we have some kind of killer app that's you know? <laughs> what is special about it is, is this language. So so you can say whatever you want about animal communication. It can be very complex. With birds, it's very complex. And primates, it can be very complex but they don't have language. And you can teach them some language. We, we, there are some studies on apes where we teach them symbols. And uh, that's very interesting because in the old days, of course, the linguists, they would define language as symbolic communication. And then when it was shown that you could teach symbolic communication to uh, gorillas and chimpanzees, the linguists uh, said, well, actually language is defined by syntax. Syntax became the most important part of language for them because they couldn't, they couldn't claim the symbolic communication anymore. So, so apes can learn some degree of symbolic communication, but it's very low level. And, and even if you compare it with a child of two or three years, they're, they're not getting close to that. And so I really look at human language as the, our defining characteristic. And what is interesting about language is that it doesn't necessarily change human psychology but it, it makes it much more complex. And it makes, for example, I'm able to explain you something that happened to me 10 days ago and you've never seen, you've never heard about it, but I can still explain it to you. So, so it gives me possibilities of communication that go far beyond anything that the animals have. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it may me, make me feel, uh, make me explain my feelings, for example, or my decisions. And so language affects everything we do and permeates everything of human behavior, but it does not necessarily change our basic psychology. And so, so ang language is very important, but, but I don't think if we make psychological comparisons that it's that important. But if you take language, for example, uh, does it affect psychology in itself? I mean, um, if, you, if your language evolves, because you speak to more people, you speak to people who have better language skills than you. Do you become able to, to feel more complex feelings, for example, because you're explained what they are? Uh, I mean, you, you go out and you, you learn what opera is about, for example. Somebody explains it to you. Somebody explains modern art to you. Um, so language itself could actually be working on our psychology and yeah, what yeah. we can feel. Yeah, I think it feed, feeds back into it, yeah. And, and so, Language is, 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 for that reason, such a very important capacity is that it affects everything it touches, basically. I would say um, another sort of human killer app would be culture. No, culture is different. Now, now, symbolic culture, yes, because that relates to language, and symbolic culture may be uniquely human. But um, 50 years ago, there was, was a, a Japanese scientist, his name is Imanishi, who, who was an anthropologist. And he already said at that time, if culture is the transmission of behavior and knowledge that is transmitted non-genetically, then culture should exist in animals. He didn't believe it was limited to humans. And, and funny enough, it, it came from a Japanese scientist, because in the West, people were absolutely not ready for this. 50 years ago, that was the time of Conrad Lawrence and Nico Tinberg, and where in the West we were talking about animal instincts. And everything was instinct, instinct, instinct. And, and that animals could potentially have culture was an impossibility, because culture was defined by the anthropologists at the time as culture is what makes us human. Culture was a uniquely human characteristic, which set us apart very sharply from the animal world. 
And so in the West, people were absolutely not ready for it. So Imanishi's message was ignored for about 30 years, 40 years. And actually, uh, Western scientists often laughed about these Japanese scientists were studying culture. And this sort of was very funny. And now, of course, culture is a big topic in animal studies. It's becoming one of the hottest topics, I think. And we have evidence for it in chimpanzees, but also in dolphins and elephants and in all sorts of animals. We have cultural transmission. In fish, people are doing studies on that. And so there's many examples of animals learning from each other. The first example that we know came from Imanishi students who had, they, they had worked with monkeys on an island in Japan where they had fed the monkeys potatoes. And one young female had taken a potato and gone to the ocean to wash the potato, to clean it before she would eat it. And uh, when she did that, a couple of days later, her friends started doing the same thing, and then her mother started doing the same thing, and very soon everyone in the group was doing the same thing. And so his students plotted over several years the transmission of behavior, and now we have tons of examples, and for chimpanzees, for example, we have at least 40 behaviors that are different from group to group, and so we speak of cultural variation in the chimpanzee. So what if you take um, a tiny chimpanzee from one group, um, transport it to another group, and it gets adopted. Does it, is it raised in the different culture there? If you would succeed in doing this uh, <laughs> without the chimp getting killed, uh, yes, it would be raised in a different culture. Actually, we have reached a stage where if you would take a videotape of chimpanzees in the field and you would show it to a uh, expert like uh, Christoph Busch, who is here, who is an expert of chimpanzees in the field, he would be able to tell you where the chimpanzee tape was taken because he would recognize certain behaviors. It's a bit like showing an Italian family at the table or a Danish family at the table. Uh, you would probably right away see the difference in, in terms of what they eat and how they talk and what they do. Uh, and, and the same, same is true for chimpanzees. You have an interesting model um, of emotional almost development. You call it the Russian doll? Yeah, the, the Russian doll model, that applies to empathy. So I think empathy has m many different levels. Uh, and so at the core of the Russian doll, there is um, a very simple sort of matching mechanism. As, as soon as I see you in a particular situation or with a, a particular emotion, it activates neural representations of those same situations, same emotions that I find myself in. And so I'm uh, sort of automatically em empathic. Um, and that's a process that's very rapid and that's, that's very hard to suppress. And, and, and for example, when people see a movie in which something terrible is gonna happen, they slam their hands for their eyes or they, they go like this because it's easier to, to regulate the visual input than the mechanism of empathy because it's an automatic, automatically uh, activated one. So that's at the core, and then the outer layers are more complex where uh, certain cognitions come in, where uh, not only do I feel what you feel, so to speak, but I, I'm beginning to wonder why you feel this way, and, and I try, it's called appraisal of the situation. I try to understand why you feel this way. And, and on top of that comes a, a, another layer, which is the outer layer, which is where I take your perspective and try to see the world from your perspective and try to understand uh, your, not only your situation, but also try to help you maybe in your situation. So, so there's all these layers to empathy and, the, and the, the more simple ones are the ones that we find in many animals. I think they, they exist in many mammals and birds. And the more complex ones we may only find in, in humans or dolphins or apes, but very few species with large brains. But there is no outer doll that, that only humans have. I think the more complex forms of theory of mind, the most complex forms of perspective taking are typically human, where, for example, in humans, you, you can read a text where someone describes a particular situation and you can feel empathic about it. Uh, I, I don't think the apes have the capacity to just by pure imagination arrive at an empathic response. And so there are certain responses, I think, that are uniquely human, but they all go back to that core response, I believe. If that one is lacking, then all the rest is not gonna be there. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one thing that, that I find very human, um, which is self-awareness, thinking about yourself the whole time, uh, always being aware of what you do, what you look like, what, what others might think of you. Um, isn't that very distinctively human? Well, well, there's actually experiments that are done on that, and, and they're called 
ex mirror experiments where we, where we put a human or uh, an animal in front of a mirror. Now, most animals, if you put them in front of a mirror, they see somebody else and they react to it as somebody else. Uh, and some animals keep doing that all their life. So, so you take a parakeet or a fish and all their life they respond to the mirror as if it's a stranger, they attack it or whatever they do with it. Um, some animals get over that. So, so dogs and cats usually, they start to adapt to a mirror and they start ignoring usually, usually the mirror. They don't see themselves, but they also know it's not interesting really, that reflection that they see. Then some other animals, they recognize themselves. Now that's a very important step. Human children reach that step when they're 18 months or 24 months old. Before that time, they also see a stranger. Uh, and apes recognize themselves. The way that is tested with apes is you put a little mark over, above their eye, a mark that they cannot see without a mirror. You put them in front of a mirror, they look at the mirror, and they touch that spot, meaning that they connect what they see in the mirror with their own body. Now, we recently did the same thing with elephants, and the reason we did it with elephants is that elephants are very empathic creatures and uh, in human psychology it is believed that there's a connection between self-awareness and empathy. The more complex forms of empathy require that you have some self-awareness. And since elephants are very empathic creatures, we thought they need to be tested. Uh, and elephants also have very large brains. They have, their brains are five kilos, which is much more than the human brain. <laughs> but it's also, it's also a big animal, of course. So anyway, we put the elephants in front of a mirror. They had been tested before by some, someone who had found negative results. And he had presented a mirror of this size to the elephant, which I'm not sure what an elephant sees in that kind of little mirror. So we decided to build a huge mirror. It was two and a half by two and a half meters. So a very big mirror, and in the center of the mirror we put a tiny little camera so that we could measure whatever the elephant did with the mirror. And the three elephants that we tested, which were three females at the Bronx Zoo in New York, they all walked up to the mirror, they were very, very interested in the mirror, they never responded socially, so they never confused the elephant in the mirror with another elephant. They tried to look behind it, uh, they put the, tr the trunks over the mirror to smell behind it. And after a while, they started testing the mirror. They started opening their mouth and looking at the inside of their mouth, which is a part of the body that they can normally never see. And, uh, and then we did the mark test with them. And the mark test means that you put uh, some mark over their eye. We put a sham mark that they couldn't see over the other eye so that they could not be, it could not be just a tactile thing that, that guided them. And then we put them in front of the mirror. And one of the three elephants passed the mark test. Uh, she, she walked up to the mirror and when she saw that the thing, she started hitting it with her trunk and feeling it. So, but, but only certain elephants do it. So it's not a very developed trait, probably. Uh, I'm not sure because all the, all the three elephants had, had non-social responses. They tried to inspect themselves and tried to, one of them moved its, its ear towards the mirror to look at it. So, so they all were showing responses that make you think that they connect the mirror image with themselves. But only one of them was interested in the mark. We think actually that elephants are not particularly interested in things on their body because they throw a lot of stuff on their body. They, they, they take hay, for example, or sand and throw it on their back. Mm. Uh, so so they, they are constantly putting stuff on and maybe a, a mark on their body doesn't care. They don't care about that. But um, chimpanzees, for example, uh, all the great apes certainly pass this test. Yeah, they pass this um, test. But when you, when you watch uh, chimpanzees or bonobos or gorillas and, and, and just observe them, do you see evidence of them sort of being self-aware or maybe sitting there, you know, thinking about themselves or something. Does it seem to you that they're... You never know. That's the same as humans. If, if you go out in the city and you would watch humans, uh, as I did in Copenhagen, sitting on a terrace watching people, you would never guess that they are self-aware. They're just walking around eating ice cream. I mean, that's what people do. And so, the, observationally, you never get to that kind of issues. For that, you really need experimental appro approaches. But do you think that, that apes sit there and ruminate about stuff? Uh, they may ruminate about certain social issues. I think they're more interested in the social arena and how, how things develop uh, with their relations with each other. I'm not sure that they are reflecting on themselves. And I'm not sure how much humans do that. Some humans do that a lot, but most humans don't, I think. Mm -hmm. Over your pretty long career, what do you think has, has been the, the, the greatest moment of, of discovery? 
Do you remember one moment? Hmm. Well, there's several. One is when I discovered reconciliation, which I, I had not expected and no one talked about anything like it at the time, which I, where I discovered that chimpanzees after a fight come together and kiss and embrace. And I still remember the day that I saw that for the first time and realized, I, I must have seen it before, but then I realized what happened and, and gave it a name um, and, and, uh, and got interested in it and I've, I've studied it ever since. Another very important moment was much more a sad, or emotional moment where one male chimpanzee that we had in a colony in Holland was killed by two other males and they, they very, very severely attacked him and they castrated him even. And uh, we couldn't save his life. And for me, it was very important because at that moment I was moving to America. Just a couple of months later, I moved to America. And I decided on the basis of what happened that I really needed to study conflict resolution because uh, until that time I had looked at conflict resolution and reconciliation as sort of nice behavior, but maybe not that important. But at that point I realized it's actually extremely important because if you don't have the appropriate mechanisms, you're going to kill each other. Uh, and and, and uh, later I got very interested in things like um, the bonobos, which, uh, which I studied in San Diego. And, and so uh, that, for me, the big surprise there was the bonobos have now become known to everybody as very sexy and very peaceful. But when I started studying them, uh, I never thought about studying sexual behavior. My, my goal was to see how they differed from chimpanzees and how they compared in, in the way they make, they, they make conflicts and resolve their conflicts. And that they did it in a very sexual way. No one had told me that. Everyone had been silent about that. Uh, I think people were very shy about sex. And uh, especially in America, people are, are very prudish and, and they would never mention such a thing. And so there was a big surprise to see uh, how Bonobos did these things. And I wrote about it much more freely than any American would ever would, I think. Yeah. I mean, that, that pretty much made the Bonobo a big name. Yeah, and, and it's a bit problematic because now the field workers are sometimes upset that the bonobos are depicted as angels of peace. And they are no, not angels. Well, there's one big difference between bonobos and chimps is that th there's not a single report of bonobos killing each other. There's not a single case that we know, and we know lots of cases for chimpanzees. So there is still this one big difference, but they're not angels of peace. And, and if people say that they are, it's not true. Now, humans, I mean, you said before that we were sort of almost um, in between chimpanzees and, and bonobos. If we had been more like bonobos, do you think we would have developed the kind of world we have today? W would we have evolved as much or would we just have, you know? I don't know. We, we, um, we certainly have been an aggressive species, but I think we have been more aggressive in the last 20,000 years or so than before. You know, when, when we settled down and, and became agriculturists, that's where we accumulated wealth and it became interesting to invade the place and, and raid the place and take all the, uh, their belongings. But there's actually no good evidence for warfare in humans from before that time. There's no evidence of armies or, or that kind of things or, or, or large mass graves with lots of people dead as you would expect if there was warfare. And so we may have lived for a very long time relatively peaceful. I think we always waged war a little bit, but more like the hunter-gatherers today who are 90% of the time or 95% of the time they live in peace also with their neighbors. And so I think we humans, we may actually uh, be, be less aggressive uh, in our long evolutionary history have been less aggressive than people think. Uh, people often think that we've always been waging war and killing everybody around us, but I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. But can we get any hint from the primates as to what is wrong with us? Why are we so aggressive? Uh, or what can we do to mitigate it? I don't think you can get concrete lessons. All that we can do by studying the primates is sort of see where we come from and, and where our psychology comes from and how it may have been shaped by evolution into the direction that it is now. But if you want to have concrete solutions to the problems today, they have to come from people mm. who are willing to make those solutions. Mm. And, and I don't think they can come from mm. primate behavior. But working with primates, uh, what about that really appeals to you? What do you really like about these animals? 
Oh, I like all animals. I, I could have worked with birds or with cows for that matter. I, I, in general, I like smart animals better than dumb animals, that's for sure. But I, I, I really like all animals. And uh, for example, I'm a big lover of fish. I have a lot of big fish tanks at home. And so um, my love is animals and primates are special in that you can make very easy comparisons with human behavior. And, and that's of course what I do in my popular books and so that, that makes primates very attractive to me is that I can make uh, very easy comparisons. But other than that, I think all animals are very interesting. Do you like animals better than humans? I like, humans are animals, so I like them too. <laughs>